Hi, I'm Tina. I like horses, music, and boys. If there are a million lover girls, I'm one of them. If there are only 10 lover girls, I'm still one of them. And if there's only one lover girl left, give Tina her crown because that means I'm dead. And the duel was epic. What's good guys, it's Alyssa. If you're new here, hello. Bob's Burgers is a show that I feel like everyone loves and if you don't, I can't trust you. Tina Belcher is one of the more popular characters of the show with people relating to her quirky awkwardness more than anything. But when I tell you if I were to create a self insert character, it would be Tina Belcher to a T. Similar to my opinion on Daria, I feel like we lose the plot a little bit and their personalities get flanderized for the general public to have a relatable character. And I don't mean the show itself is doing the flanderizing. <laughs> But I mean the internet. People cherry pick certain personality traits of these characters to have a ha ha that's so me moment, but completely strip away the other traits that make these characters them. For Daria, I feel like that's her monotone delivery and her sarcasm, but people never really attach to her mean girl personality traits or her self-righteousness. With Tina, I feel like it's her clumsy awkwardness. And sometimes I think that people forget that you know them in real life because survey says, and it makes me question if people actually watch the show, but I am not exaggerating when I say I'm a fan fiction writing, boy crazy, booty loving, girl who wears glasses that was also a below average student. There was a point that was made in a video by Man of a Thousand Thoughts that Tina is nerd presenting, but is not actually a geek, contrary to her appearance. Like the other Belcher kids, Tina does not excel in school and is more of a creative than an intellectual. Rather than join the mathletes or something, Tina would rather join a social club like the Thunder Girls. And we often see in media like She's All That or Superstar that the unpopular nerd is often scared to talk to boys that they like or completely uninterested in the idea of dating altogether. But not Tina. Tina dreams of falling in love and is not afraid to put herself out there to find the one. No matter how embarrassing, and trust me, it takes a lot for Tina to be embarrassed. Although Tina has had some confidence issues, which just comes with growing pains and finding yourself, I would consider Tina to be pretty brave for how confidently she goes after what she wants. And she does this a lot, like a lot, a lot. So as you can see by the title, I'll be focusing on why Tina is my personal hot girl icon by doing the deepest dive on all her potential soulmates, obsessions, and short-lived flings. And by the end, you'll have a better idea on why Tina Belcher is the certified lover girl. Through the pan of 14 seasons, Tina has had a lot of love interests. So together, let's go through the good, the bad, and the weird. Let's start with my opinion on the better of her love interests. In the episode, Linda Pendant Woman, Linda decides to shop at a new grocery store called Fresh Food to save the family some money. She brings the kids with her and Tina notices that there's a mystery person behind the milk. When Linda actually starts working at Fresh Food, Tina, still fascinated by the mystery person behind the milk, asks for a tour of the milk aisle. While Tina is behind the milk, a handsome man, as she calls it, reaches for some. She notices a band-aid on the index finger and asks what happened. The mystery boy says that his turtle bit him. Both fascinated by each other, they decide to say their ages at the same time. They both say 25, but then quickly say their real ages, with Tina being 13 and the boy being 14. The boy gets a text from his mom and has to leave, but Tina didn't get any of his information. When she reaches for his hand as he's leaving, his band-aid slips off and she keeps it as a keepsake. After hosting an unsuccessful Cinderella-like search to find the boy who fits the band-aid, Tina is wallowing behind the milk when a boy comes. When she asks him to put his hand out, she finds her Cinderella -ed? I don't know. The boy admits that he's been coming back every day and hopes to see Tina again and finally meet face to face. Tina believes that they'll ruin the fantasy if they see each other face to face, but the boy pulls her through the milk and tells her to live a little and take a chance. We finally learn that the boy's name is Josh, and they share their first kiss with each other through the milk after being encouraged to do so by Jean and Louise. Tina gives Josh her number, but after not hearing from him for three episodes, we find out in the episode two for Tina that he put her number in his dance pants and they got all sweaty. We also find out that Josh goes to a performing arts high school when he invites Tina to his school dance on Friday. But Tina gives him a maybe because she already asked Jimmy Jr., who told her the best he can give her is a maybe. Since Jimmy Jr. is Tina's main love, interest, he'll be intertwined in some of these stories, but I'll save my opinion of him on his segment. Contrary to Jimmy Jr.'s response, Josh doesn't give Tina a maybe, and he says he definitely wants to go with her. And Tina is loving the options, so she decides to prolong her decision and have Josh and Jimmy Jr. fight for their spot. Her parents convince her to go with Josh because self-worth. But at Josh's school dance, Jimmy Jr. crashes it and they end up having a dance-off for Tina's heart. 
But when the boys begin to fight, Tina stops them before they get hurt. She admits that she can't choose. Maybe I don't have to choose. Tina decides that she wants both of them in a sort of BLT love triangle, a JJT if you will. But Josh and Jimmy Jr. aren't down with that, and this completely weirds Josh out. If you ever go back to being a one boy girl, you know where to find me. Josh and Jimmy Jr. dance away, and we never see him again. Until the episode Tappy 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 Tap 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 when Josh invites Tina to his tap dance recital. But in this episode, Tina has lost interest in him and is trying to figure out a way to let him down easy because she believes that Josh is still in love with her. Josh ends up getting hurt by doing a freestyle stare trick during the tap show. Tina believes that it's sabotage and wants to solve this mystery so he'll be grateful and won't be as hurt when she tells him that she only likes him as a friend. In the end, Tina uncovers the mystery that Josh sabotaged himself because he didn't lock the stairs like he thought after he moved them. They both end up telling each other at the same time that they just like each other as friends. In the episode Mazel Tina, Tina is upset that her frenemy, heavy on the enemy part, Tammy didn't invite her to her bat mitzvah. When she learns that one of Tammy's caterers dropped out, Tina offers up her dad's restaurant to fill in. You may have heard of it, Bob's Burgers? It's not that popular. I hear they don't make that much money. This allows Tina to be invited by association. At the bat mitzvah, Tina fills in for Tammy's party coordinator who quits on the spot. Louise decides to pull a prank that gets her and Tammy stuck inside the giant Tammy head floating above the party. With Tammy being MIA, Tina decides to fill in for her to stick to the schedule. That includes the ladies choice dance with Justin, the most popular kid at Tammy's Hebrew school. When Tina has the opportunity to free Louise and Tammy from inside the head, she decides to stall because it's time for the ladies choice dance with Justin. While Tina is dancing with Justin, she decides to cop a feel of his butt, which is sitting strangely high on his back. Tina gets busted when Tammy jumps so hard that her legs break through the Tammy head causing the whole party to notice and free them from inside. A furious as Tammy confronts her and Tina throws Justin under the bus, making it seem like he was the one that wanted to dance and he put her hands on his butt. When we all know that not to be true because, I mean, it's a ladies choice dance. And Louise and Tammy have been watching her the whole night. In the episode Can't Buy Me Math, Tina is failing math and is in danger of taking a remedial math class. So that she doesn't have to tell her grandkids she's bad at math, she decides to ask 7th grade nerd Daryl to tutor her. After Daryl declines to tutor her to focus on robotics in his free time, Tina suggests Saturday, which is the day of the Valentine's dance. This offends Daryl because Tina assumes since he's a nerd, he's not going to the dance either. But this sparks an idea in Daryl's brain. I'll tutor you if you'll be my date to the Valentine's dance. Daryl pitches an idea that he and Tina fake dates so that they can win Cupid's couple at the school dance. Then after they break up, they can date whoever they want, like the couple that won last year's Cupid's couple. Tina of course has a crush on Jimmy Jr. and Daryl has a crush on an 8th grader named Rosa. He believes that this will help Rosa not see him as a little boy since Tina is also an 8th grader. Since Tina is fake dating Daryl, she covers up the picture of Jimmy Jr. that she has in her locker, along with doing other cutesy things to help convince their friends that they're a real couple. Daryl pulls out all the stops at the Valentine's dance so that they have a better chance at winning Cupid's couple. We cannot let them win Cupid's couple. Hold on, I got a good idea. But while Daryl is serenading Tina, she actually begins to fall in love with him for real. Tina suggests that they kiss to make it look more authentic. But if you know anything about Tina, she can be a little grimy with her intentions sometimes. Daryl and Tina end up winning Cupid's couple and the $50 frozen yogurt gift card, which they end up giving to Louise and Jean for keeping their secret. After their dramatic fake public breakup, Daryl immediately starts to date Rosa as planned. In a turn of events, Tina starts to get jealous of Daryl and Rosa's relationship. When Jimmy Jr. invites her to bowl, she's not even excited to go because she's still hung up on Daryl. Hmm, feels like there's a strike in here. Huh. Those cheeks aren't leaving me weak like they usually do. Tina can't stand the sight of Daryl and Rosa flirting across from her at bowling. And she really can't stand seeing Daryl do their signature it's a beetle on your back move. Tina explodes and confesses their whole plan to everybody. That they fake dated so that Daryl could date Rosa and she could date Jimmy Jr. after they won Cupid's couple. Jimmy Jr. is weirded out by this and decides to leave. <laughs> had a nickel for every time that happened. I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? Tina admits that she fell for Daryl in the midst of their fake relationship, which was not part of the plan at all. Daryl points out that he and Tina have nothing in common, but he and Rosa have everything in common. This makes Tina feel bad because she broke up a great couple and decides to get Rosa and Daryl back together. Oh boy, I hope I'm as good at getting you guys back together as I was at breaking you up. Which, I mean, is a little unfair that Tina is the one going down for this because 
this was initially Daryl's idea to begin with. Tina was just the one who blew up the spot. Tina admits that she tricked herself into liking a version of Daryl that she created. Since Daryl was not too good at the boyfriend thing, Tina just made him do all the things that she would like her partner to do in a relationship. And in the end, Tina is successful at getting Rosa and Daryl back together. And this is oddly the last we see of Rosa too. Tina and Daryl got so caught up in fake dating, they completely forgot the whole point of all this. And that was to tutor her in math. So after Tina fails her math test, she has to take the remedial math class anyway. But to her surprise, Jimmy Jr. is in this class too. You want to be bad at math together? Yeah, okay, sure. Later down the line, in the episode The Hormoniums, Tina kisses Daryl to prove that she won't die from mono, contrary to the message that their counselor, Mr. Fron, was trying to convey. Along with attempting to kiss everyone in the auditorium, Daryl and Tina aren't seen doing anything intentionally romantic for the rest of the show so far. In the episode Carpe Museum, Tina is paired with Henry Haber on the school field trip, who she believes is the dorkiest guy in school. Interestingly, they both believe this about each other, and throughout the field trip, they're secretly trying to make each other more cool. As they're touring the museum, Tina stops to introduce Henry to Jimmy Jr. because she claims he's one of the coolest kids in school. Henry Haber says that he already knows Jimmy Jr., but when he says hi to him, Jimmy Jr. calls him Harvey. Embarrassing! <laughs> As they're touring the prehistoric section, Henry Haber is about to go on a rant about this negative when Tina stops him, talking to him like a toddler. Henry, what did I say about dinosaurs? Why are you talking that way? Someone walks past him and calls who I assume Henry a dork, but Data's still inconclusive. He's offended because he believes Tina is the dork and that everyone at school thinks she is too. And as we know, Tina thinks the same about him. He and Tina go around the museum asking other students who they think is more of a dork. And it's pretty much a tie between everyone except for the museum tour guide who says that they're kids and they should be playing this game. Jeez, never ask a dork to judge a dork contest. They both come to terms that they're both dorks because she's into horses and zombies and Henry says he's a dork for graphic novels and dinosaurs. In the episode The Millie Cherry and Candidate, Henry Haper uses Louise and her stalker Millie as pawns to become school president. Tina acknowledges his wit. Wow, brains and brawn is what I would say if you had the brown part. But it's unclear if this is in general or romantically, cause Tina says stuff like this all the time. In the episode Ain't Miss Debatin', Henry offers Tina to join the debate team because they need another girl since their last member quit to focus on the spelling bee. Tina declines because she has other social commitments like her on again, off again relationship with Jimmy Jr. And she has a fear of public speaking. She believes they're in a sweet patch to be on again. Until she spots him doing whatever this is across the cafeteria with another girl. To make a look, I can kiss my elbow. Cool. Which I guess puts them in an off again situation, opening up her schedule to join the debate team. Tina gets paired with Henry to work on her debating skills. What makes you tick, 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 explode? I think of when they canceled Firefly. You try. I guess it makes me mad that they call it your bottom when it's in the middle. Henry starts to fall for Tina mid-debate when she finds her Firefly, which is her remembering Jimmy Jr. in the lunchroom talking to another girl. That gives her the passion to debate things that she doesn't actually believe in. After the debate, he calls her beautiful, then asks if she wants to go on a date. In debate fashion, they rapid fire the pros and cons of going on said date, which then convinces Tina that she should probably date him romantically. Linda is concerned about Henry Haber coming to the door for the date because I assume she knows he's not her type. So Henry seems to be here. Uh, what's going on with that? Tina admits that even though she's not attracted to him, he's perfect boyfriend material. And zero out of 10 would not recommend doing that. That is a recipe for resentment disaster. Henry Haber is excited to be dating Tina, especially since she's killing it at the debates. Unfortunately, as much as Henry was a good boyfriend, Tina ends up kissing another guy from the other team. Riddled with guilt, she confesses her wrongdoing and breaks up with Henry mid-debate. You're using our first negative to tell me you kissed Duncan? And to break up with you. This leaves Henry heartbroken. You know how long it'll take me to find another girlfriend? Two seasons. The answer is two seasons. In the episode UFO No You Didn't, Henry starts to date Susmita and even takes her to a Boys For Now concert in the season 11 episode Fast Time Capsules at Wagstaff School, which someone should really update on his wiki. In the episode Sleeping with the Frenemy, Tammy is going on a cruise to Turks and Caicos for spring break, but misses the cruise's departure when she left to buy lip gloss. Tina suggests that she stay with the family so that she can get her Thunder Girl badge for doing something nice, contrary to everyone else's wishes. What if Tammy stays with us? No, thank you. No. Mm -mm. 
Mm -mm, mm -mm. Tammy is not used to the lifestyle that the Belchers live and is expecting princess treatment from them. Linda suggests that Tammy start to help out because that's what everyone does in their house. So they put her to work in the restaurant. And honestly, she could just do what Louise and Jean do, the bare minimum, weaponize her incompetence. Is that what the girls on TikTok are saying these days? Tammy starts to cry and throw a tantrum when she realizes that she's living Tina's life. Then a boy walks in to pick up an order for his grandpa and sees Tammy in distress. When he asks her what's wrong, she tells him that she just wanted to take a break. Which makes it seem like they're refusing her a break when really she just put her apron on five seconds ago and Tina was just calling her out on her laziness. He then offers Tammy his handkerchief. Here's a handkerchief. I carry one in case I run into sad humans or boogers. Who are you? Oh, yeah. I'm Brett. Brett is in town visiting his grandfather, so not being from around there, he isn't aware of Tammy's ways and the usual dynamics of the restaurant. He tells Tammy that he doesn't meet down to earth girls like her who work in a restaurant at his private school. A boy comes in here looking for a girl who works in a restaurant with lots of snot and he doesn't meet you. Brett asks Tammy if this is her family's restaurant and she answers no in disgust. It says that her family left her there and the Belchers are making her work. Technically true, I gotta allow it. Tammy gives Brett her number, but when Tina tries to give him her number two, he's already out the restaurant. Brett starts texting Tammy before they go to bed. I'm smelling my burger wrapper and thinking of you. Tammy thinks he's cute, but kind of weird, while Tina thinks he's perfect. Brett keeps sending Tammy weird texts that she's not sure how to respond to, so Tina starts texting Brett for her. They end up texting all night, and their conversations lead him to planning a date. This freaks Tammy out because she realizes she can't do the date. He'll be expecting Tina's dorky weirdo personality. Her words, not mine. Louise hears their dilemma through the walls and hatches a plan. Tammy will have an earpiece in during the date and Tina will be listening through the phone, communicating back, telling her what to say to Brett. Yes, but that would be cheating. The date is going as planned until Tina's phone dies, leaving Tammy to fly solo. After awkwardly saying that ugly people are bad, Brett's confusion makes her run away back to the restaurant. Back in Tina's room, Tina confesses to Tammy that she likes Brett a lot. Tammy just laughs and tells her that she doesn't even know him, even though Tina has been the one communicating with him the whole time. Brett shows up at Tina's window to ask why Tammy ran away. Tina has Tammy do ventriloquy this time in order to communicate with Brett. And Tina must really have a way with words because she makes Brett really want to kiss Tammy. So they do. A lot. And Tina and Louise just watch. Louise apologizes because she thought this plan was going to go disastrously wrong, but instead, things went disastrously right. When things start getting serious and Tammy almost becoming his out of town girlfriend, Tina has had enough. But Louise stops her, insinuating that she should sabotage the date by giving Tammy bad things to say instead of helping her. For convenience, the dinner date ends up being at the restaurant with Tina providing Tammy with napkin note cards. When Tina tries to sneak a hypothetical scenario on Tammy's napkins, Tammy flips out when Tina refuses to provide her with more napkins. Cause I need one! Tammy nonchalantly gives up and Tina confesses to Brett that he's been talking to her all along. Brett feels tricked because he told his grandpa about Tammy, who's really Tina. Tammy gets sick of their bickering and tells them to take their gross chemistry to the beach. Again, her words, not mine. So Brett and Tina go down to the beach and do some kissing. I think. They didn't really show it. As I was watching these episodes, it was nice to see that Tina had some enjoyable romantic encounters. But honestly, Josh was my favorite and Brett was like the perfect fling. As much as Henry Hayward was boyfriend material, Tina didn't like him back, so that was unfortunate. And she cheated on him, so that's just horrible. I included Daryl in the good because he didn't treat Tina as badly as we'll see in the ones in the next section. And Justin spent too little time with Tina, so I just didn't know where to put him. Jimmy Jr. is Tina's main love interest throughout the series. He's also the son of Bob's rival, Jimmy Pesto. In the episode She's Cat Bob, Tina wants to have a boy-girl mingling 13th birthday party and be able to kiss Jimmy Jr. This is actually the first time that we see Jimmy Jr. and his bud. Slap it! He was also her very first kiss. According to Wiki, they have shared six kisses together. But after watching all these episodes, it definitely feels like more.
Tina was not exaggerating when she said that she and Jimmy Jr. have an on again, off again dynamic. Let's get into it. The next time we see Jimmy Jr. in Spaghetti Western and Meatballs, Tina tries to share a noodle with him, Lady in the Tramp style, but he disses her. Everyone but Tina seems to see that Jimmy Jr. does not reciprocate Tina's affection towards him. It's pretty obvious Jimmy Jr. is not into you. In the episode Burger War, Bob bans his kids from interacting with Jimmy Pesto's kids. Why does Tina have to like Jimmy Pesto Jr.? Of all the 13-year-old boys in the world. Yeah, she likes them too. But they're hard-headed, so I don't know why he thought they'd listen to that. Jimmy Jr. didn't even know Tina's name and called her Tracy. No, Dad, I'm gonna dance with Tracy. Tina. Tina. In the episode The Bell Cheese, Jimmy Jr finally admits that Tina is hot because she's strong, but in her newfound confidence, tells him to put it on a t-shirt. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> then we get to the episode Bad Tina, and we're introduced to Tina's erotic friend fiction, where Jimmy Jr. is usually the star alongside her. Tammy invites Jimmy Jr. and his best friend Zeke over, which is completely against the rules. Everyone except Tina drinks margarita mix and pretends to be drunk in her room. Tina is instead focused on trying to impress Jimmy Jr. by having Tammy do her hair just like hers. <laughs> In the end, after Tina reads her erotic friend fiction in front of the whole school, Jimmy Jr. finds her friend fiction to be cool. In the episode, My Fuzzy Valentine, it's Valentine's Day and Tina doesn't want to go to school because last year she got a Valentine's card from Jimmy Jr. signed from instead of love. No one says I from you. But in the end, Jimmy Jr. redeems himself by giving Tina a card with a heart instead of a from, which warms Tina's heart. Tina wants to go to the school dance with Jimmy Jr. in the episode 2 for Tina, but when she asks him, he says, Uh, the best I can do now is a maybe. I want to know what all my options are first. And as we know, Josh has also asked Tina to his school dance. Bob tells Tina to go with the kid that actually wants to go with her, and Linda agrees that a yes is better than a maybe. Linda is known to be Jimmy Jr.'s number one anti. Each one is lucky to have you, except Jimmy Jr. I'm not sold on him. Wait, what? Nothing. Jimmy Jr. only decided he definitely definitely wanted to go with Tina after she told him that another boy asked her to the dance. This is a common pattern with Jimmy Jr. too. He says that when Tina tells him no, it makes him want her more. In the Family Fracas episode, Jimmy Jr. is amazed at Tina winning a competition round while sitting watching with Zeke. Jimmy Jr. and the rest of the Pestos end up competing against Tina and her family in Family Fracas. Although Tina has a huge crush on Jimmy Jr., she has a more competitive mean spirit towards him in this episode. When his family was the game show, Jimmy Jr declines to let Tina and her siblings view Dirty Dancing in the minivan they won because of the mean things that she said during Family Fracas. Your ass is grass and I'm gonna mow it. Leave me alone! This happens often where Tina is the aggressor towards Jimmy Jr. instead of the other way around. Come on, keep up. What part of the chicken dance don't you understand? Tina, you're kind of getting an attitude. In the episode The Unnatural, Tina becomes addicted to espresso. She sees Jimmy Jr. riding past on his bike and in her hyperactivity asks him on a date, to which Jimmy Jr. agrees Agrees. Linda sells the espresso machine so that Jean can go to an exclusive baseball training. Exclusive in quotations, go watch the episode. Tina is having an angry withdrawal from coffee and goes off on Jimmy Jr. calling him annoying and blames it on his speech impediment. She also loves coffee, espresso, caffeinated tea, and Jimmy Jr. In that order. In the episode Presto Tino, Jimmy Jr. is putting on a magic show. He shows Tina a magic trick where he pulls out some flowers from a magic wand and Tina thinks those flowers are for her. Jimmy Jr. also also iterates that coming to watch him practice is not a date, even though Tina believes it is. When Tina realizes that magicians have assistants, she fantasizes about being Jimmy Jr.'s. In order to get Jimmy Jr. to ask her to be his assistant, she breaks into his locker after trying the combination a couple thousand times and squeezes herself inside. Jimmy Jr. finally agrees to have Tina be his assistant, but he's paying her no mind during practice and even leaves her inside the box, telling her to sweep up all the confetti he threw around while dancing. Jimmy Jr. and Tina Tina get into an argument because Tina is trying to suggest things to make his performance better. This rift causes them to get in a magic competition. Jimmy Jr. then replaces Tina with Tammy as his assistant. Tina sabotages his performance by replacing his music with polyrhythmic synth jazz. No one can dance to that. She quickly regrets this decision when she sees him making a fool of himself on stage. But in the end, Jimmy Jr. and Tina end up winning an award for best on stage chemistry. Tina tries out for cheerleading in the episode Gene It On, but in a mishap that leads to her biting her tongue and being unable to speak audibly, Louise becomes her interpreter. 
Jimmy Jr. stops to say hi to Tina in passing, and Louise interprets Tina's friendly response to Jimmy Jr. in a harsh way. Jimmy Jr. is offended at first, but likes that Tina is playing hard to get, so he asks her out on a date on Friday. Louise exploits this situation by spending the whole day misinterpreting Tina to get food out of Jimmy Jr. In the end, Tina is fed up with Louise and lets Jimmy Jr. know what her real dream date with him would be. We'd watch a movie, probably 27 dwarfs, then we'd walk along the beach at low tide and find a cozy place to sit in the kelp and kiss. Jimmy Jr. is actually able to understand her because she sounds like him, which makes me question if he's been able to understand her this whole time. He agrees that that would be his dream date as well. In the episode, Tina and the Real Ghost, Tina wants to make sure that Jimmy Jr. is going to the mausoleum on Halloween. Jimmy Jr. is adamant on telling her that they are not going together and that it's a bunch of kids going at the same time. So not a date. As I said, Jimmy Jr. only wants Tina's attention when she has the attention of another boy. In the episode, The Land Ship, after finding out that Tina has been kissing and hanging out with Ghost Boy, he asked if she would like to watch The Land Ship Parade with him. Then, in the episode The Gene and Courtney Show, Tina is in charge of the Valentine's Day donations for carnations and is hoping to get a card from Jimmy Jr. But when Jimmy Jr. walks past her table, she asks if he's gonna fill one out. He's nonchalant and doesn't even answer her question. Tina becomes obsessed with knowing if she received a carnation and in a frenzy opens up all the cards. She finds out that she didn't receive a single one. After passing out everyone else's Valentine's carnations, she's bummed that she didn't receive one. But at the end of the school day, Jimmy Jr. brings Tina a rose because he wasn't sure how to order a carnation for her because she was always at the table. I think that sometimes you think that things are romantic when they're like not. This is after she beat Tina walking with Jimmy Jr. And Tina tried to get them to hold hands by pointing out some clouds that she said looked like two people holding hands. Jimmy Jr. doesn't take the bait at all and runs home so that his hair didn't get wet before it started raining. In the episode Teen A Witch, Tina gets a book of spells from the school librarian and finds some love spells that she decides to test on Jimmy Jr. We find out that she has a drawer full of his things like an old gym sock, his old and his toothbrush. The kids believe that the spell on Jimmy Jr. worked when he decides to sit with her at lunch. Jimmy Jr., wanna walk my ass to class? Uh, okay. At the end of the episode, The Quirk Deucers, Tina puts on a Thanksgiving play where she and Jimmy Jr. share a long, long kiss to close it out. In the beginning of the episode, Ex Mach Tina, Tina suggests to Jimmy Jr. that they should go to the school bonfire together, to which Jimmy Jr. responds by making a groaning noise. Tina breaks her ankle after going to school with wedges on. Hi, heels on my tippies. Now on crutches, Mr. Front offers her a chance to test out new robotic technology for disabled students that can't attend school. Even though Tina is now in 3008, this doesn't help Tina's social status in the slightest. She gets shoved into the AV closet by the janitor and nobody even notices. Jimmy Jr. barges into the AV closet to vent about his dad making him go to speech therapy instead of dance class. They spend the whole day talking to each other in the AV closet and Jimmy Jr. says she's really easy to talk to as a robot. Tina and Jimmy Jr. start to spend more time together at school and his friends become jealous. However, in person, Jimmy Jr. acts really different towards her. So, so, any new museums? I'm gonna go. Oh. He asks Tina to be his date to the bonfire and she assumes he means in person, but he wants her to come as a robot. She realizes that he doesn't like her as her, he likes her as a robot. The whole family watches Tina's date through her laptop. Then things get awkward when Jimmy Jr. tries to kiss Tina Bot, and Tina doesn't like this at all. She shows up to the bonfire in person to spin this date properly and saves him from bombing when he decides to perform his musolems. Oh, you mean like songs? No, they're called musolems. This sentimental gesture was the perfect reason for an in-person kiss. In the episode Bob Actually, it's Valentine's Day and Jimmy Jr. asks Tina if she's free at lunch and if she can meet him in the gym. Valentine's Day plans? Today? Lunch? Me? With you? <laughs> but it turns out it's not just the two of them. Everyone is in the gym and Jimmy Jr. wants to do a sky kiss on the trampoline. Unfortunately, Tina is having some bowel issues after having a chili eating contest with her siblings the night before. Girls just diarrhea. But Tina solves this problem by using stilts to achieve the sky kiss. 
This for me was when I realized Jimmy Jr. is the scum between my toes. In the episode V for Valentine Detta, Tina is moping because Jimmy Jr. is hanging out more with fellow student Becky, making Tina worried that Jimmy Jr. won't be her Valentine this year. Tina becomes even more upset when she gets an accidental text that Jimmy Jr. asked Becky to be his Valentine. Time of death. 9.15 a.m. Linda and Louise spend the day trying to make Tina feel better, but nothing is working. Tina finally confesses that the reason she's really upset is because she made Jimmy Jr. a picture frame with a picture of them inside. And F-Boy Jr. decided to hang it in his locker with a picture of Becky in it. They decide to sabotage Jimmy Jr.'s date, but Tina can't do it because Becky looks so happy to be there. When Tina tells Becky about the picture frame thing, Becky does not like that at all. And to make matters worse, Jimmy Jr. breaks up with Becky on their date. Well, I was feeling until we got our heart-shaped flaming flan, but I think we should break up. There just isn't anything here. Becky thinks he's joking, but Tina says he does this a lot. They then sabotage Jimmy Jr. instead by throwing stink bombs, grabbing Becky, and running out the restaurant. I'm describing each relationship in chronological order, so after everything we just discussed prior to this episode, he decides to do this to Tina? What's the point? Just like the rest of us though, she won't learn this lesson until her frontal lobe is completely developed. I still got 10 more months to go. Oh, I've just gotten word that it in fact doesn't get better after your frontal lobe is developed. It's so simple. I don't know how I didn't think of it before. I'll give up. In the episode Every Which Way But Goose, Tina is waiting on Jimmy Jr. to ask her to the 8th grade dance, but he's blatantly avoiding asking her. Like when Tina asks if he has anything to say to her, he asks to get the restroom pass. Then in the lunchroom, when Tina suggests that she open up some space for him to ask her, he leaves the cafeteria and says he has something to do in the hallway. Jimmy Jr. then asks to speak to Tina somewhere in private, which Tina thinks he's gonna ask her to the dance, but instead he tells her that he's not going to the dance. This infuriates Tina. Later, Jimmy Jr. confesses to Louise and Jean, who are trying to get Jimmy Jr. to ask Tina to the dance, that he pulled a muscle in his butt while trying to do moves from Save the Last Dance. When Jimmy Jr. finally confesses to Tina why he didn't take her to the dance, Tina doesn't care because she's heartbroken about Bruce, who, I'll get into later. But after Jimmy Jr. saves Bruce from being stuck, she gives him a kiss on the cheek. Tina finds out that Jimmy Jr. is actually a horrible runner in the episode The Gene Mile. The students have to run a mandatory mile, and after Jimmy Jr. declines Tina's invitation to run together, he boasts about running the mile in under nine minutes. But in the end, Tina does that gorgeous idiot. You gorgeous idiot! There's one person that gets in the way of Tina and Jimmy Jr. time, and that's his best friend Zeke. In the episode Yes Without My Zeke, Tina invites Jimmy Jr. to the pier after school. But but before Jimmy Jr. can answer, which I'm pretty sure he was gonna say no, Zeke says that he's gonna go, making Jimmy Jr. immediately say that he's coming too. Zeke is a troublemaker and is one disciplinary action away from being sent to disciplinary school. Who, who will I eat lunch with? Me. Who will I wrestle with? Me. Who's going to explain cootie catchers to me? Me. I mean, I kind of got them. This would ultimately free up Jimmy Jr.'s time, allowing Tina more time to spend with him in his butt. In the end though, it's Tina who saves Zeke from getting in trouble and allowing him to stay at Wagstaff. I guess Tina would rather have a Zeke wrestling Jimmy Jr. than a zeke one. Jimmy Jr. says that Tina made him the happiest boy when she came up with the plan to sneak them out of the school to save Zeke from being caught by Mr. Frond. But at what cost? Tina is excited to be invited to the haunted hayride in the episode Pig Trouble in Little Tina because all the kids are saying that it's going to be romantic and of course, she wants to get romantic with Jimmy Jr. But after falling into peer pressure by making fun of a dead fetal pig during class, Tina becomes sleep deprived because she's haunted by this pig. Wanna hang out? Like socially? Yeah. Like boyfriend, girlfriend? Oh, I, I mean. On the haunted hayride, Tina is so tired that she goes to sleep before she gets a chance to kiss Jimmy Jr. But after making peace with the pig, she wakes up and remembers to get that kiss. Tina participates in a limo race where she's role-playing a student going to prom but gets flaked on by her date in the episode Clear and Present Ginger. She's been fantasizing about actual prom ever since she put that dress on to get into character. Her dream is to go to prom with Jimmy Jr. So this concept freaks her out and she's been texting Jimmy Jr. all night. His lack of responses make her afraid that she's actually gonna get stood up on her actual prom day. But at the end, Jimmy Jr. calls her back and apologizes if he missed prom. Sorry if I missed prom, was it? 
tonight. I think I didn't pay attention during announcements or something. Still a red flag. Tina, if you're listening to this, do not invite that boy to prom in three to four years. Or the Sadie Hawkins dance, I guess. In the two-part season 12 finale, Some Like It Bob, Tina gets a new shirt that she buys with her own money. She's hoping to get some attention from the people that matter, but Jimmy Jr. doesn't even notice that her shirt is new. In part two, we find out that Tina keeps a box of Jimmy Jr.'s chewed gum. I guess she can add that to the collection of his other things. Why so many wet marshmallows? From his hot chocolate. They also share some more fictional kisses, including an extra greasy one in her Grease-inspired friend fiction. Before we get into season 13, I have to discuss the Bob's Burgers movie, which I actually saw in theaters, and you should watch it if you haven't, because it's good. Also, spoilers if you haven't, I can't believe you made it this far. In the Bob's Burgers movie, Tina wants to make Jimmy Jr. her official summer boyfriend, but is too afraid to ask. I'm not gonna do it. I am gonna do it. Here I go. Nope, going back over here. Can't do it. Most of her interactions with Jimmy Jr. in the movie is through her friend fiction, where they ride horseback and Jimmy Jr. doesn't wear pants. In her own fantasy, Jimmy Jr. makes Tina acknowledge that she has doubts about him and that's why she hasn't asked him to be her boyfriend yet. Tina becomes envious when she sees Tammy has her summer boyfriend's retainer around her neck and decides this is the perfect time to give Jimmy Jr. her barrette kiss. but chickens out again. In Tina's hallucination of Jimmy Jr., he says that she's not afraid of Jimmy saying no. Jimmy, Jimmy, who the? He says that she's not afraid of him saying no. She's afraid of Jimmy Jr. saying yes and that he won't be as good of a boyfriend as he is in her fantasy. And she's right. Tina believes that she's letting her butt lead her heart down a dead end road. So she throws the barrette kiss that she made for him into the ocean. Oh, is that gonna choke a fish? At the end of the movie, Jimmy Jr. says that he was down on the beach when he found her barrette kiss. He gives it to Tina because she has a barrette like the one on the necklace. She takes it as a sign to tell Jimmy Jr. how she feels, which is still a little up in the air for me. I kept rewinding that part to understand what conclusion they came to, but they still didn't become summer boyfriend girlfriend. But she ends up really wanting to kiss Jimmy Jr., so she does. Back to the series. In the episode What About Job, Tina tells an Indiana Jones style story where she makes Jimmy Jr. the bad guy because she's mad at him for not sharing his gum at school. His evil motives are that he's jealous of her job as the boy's renowned manager and personal masseuse. Tina is going to support Jimmy Jr. at Spencer Blinkenship's Modern Dance Seminar in the episode So You Stink You Can Dance, where they believe his dancing career will launch. Tina fantasizes a world where he becomes a famous backup dancer and she might become a famous backup singer. And together, they become a famous backup couple. In the episode What a April Fool Believes, Louise is concerned because Jimmy Jr. asked Tina on a frozen yogurt date on April Fool's Day. But it turned out that Jimmy Jr. just didn't know it was April Fool's Day. I thought that wasn't until May. No, it's today, April 1st. At the time of recording this, we're 11 episodes into season 14. Nothing new to report as of yet. Like I said, Zeke is Jimmy Jr.'s troublemaking, high energy best friend. Tina finds Zeke to be pretty gross most of the time. Zeke! This is why I'm Not only hard. friends with women. But I think due to his close proximity to Jimmy Jr. and her having to be around him so much makes him tolerable over time. In the episode Midday Run, Tina is going to be promoted to Hall Manatee, a hall monitor promotion. But after Zeke runs away from her, after she allows him to use the bathroom on their way to deliver him to the principal, this puts her promotion in jeopardy. He's in trouble for stealing the Wagstaff school mascot outfit, which he says is for his grandmother who's in a nursing home and loves the mascot, and he just wants to cheer her up before her surgery. Surgery. Of course she doesn't believe him, but at the end of the episode, it turned out to be true. It could have been told in a joking manner, but Zeke claims now he and Tina have a story to tell at their wedding. Now I got a story to tell on our wedding day. You think that's not gonna happen, but I'll get you, girl. I'm gonna get you. In the episode, Broadcast Wagstaff News, Tina creates a competing news broadcast at their school when she isn't chosen to be an anchor. And Tina follows the story to find the Mad Pooper, a serial pooper who has been leaving poopy surprises around their school. The mad pooper turns out to be Zeke. He claims that the first time he did it was by accident, but he kept it going so that Tina could have her big story and enjoy her newfound popularity as the school news anchor. And circling back to the episode The Hormoniums, Tina is chosen to star in a school play by Mr. Frond and fantasizes newfound fame. In her fantasy, Zeke and Jimmy Jr. are head over heels for her and even propose to her. And in the end credits, in a game of spin the bottle, Zeke and Tina kiss. 
In the episode The Odor Games, Zeke tries to stop Tina from hitting him with a water balloon by confessing his love to her and saying that Jimmy Jr. takes her for granted, which is true. And I'm also not sure if Zeke meant what he said about being in love with Tina. I'm leaning towards he was just trying to save his butt. Back to the episode UFO No You Didn't, Henry Haber tricks Tina and Susmita into thinking they made contact with aliens who want to destroy the planet. Tina believes this might be her last day on Earth, so she does something she really wants to do, and that's kiss Jimmy Jr. And in the same energy, says screw it and kisses Zeke too. In the episode Beef Squatch, Tina meets Nathan at a taping of Get On Up, a morning show hosted by married couple Pam and Chuck Charles. Bob wins a chance to host a segment on their show called Hey Good Cooking, but only because they're amused by Gene's character Beef Squatch, who ends up being the star of the show. Nathan is obviously obsessed with Pam. He keeps asking about her and making weird moaning sounds every time Tina answers a question about her. Did you get to meet Pam? Who, the host lady? Yeah. <sighs> Nathan walks into the restaurant and immediately asks Tina on a date. Even for Tina, he seems a bit pushy, but she accepts the date. Nathan meets Tina on set and says that he's ready to take their relationship to the next level. Tina thinks he means making out, but he actually means taking him backstage to meet Pam. Don't tell me how to love you! Nathan, you might be in this for the wrong reasons. Tina, of course, breaks up with him after he admits that he only dated her to go backstage and meet Pam. Nathan even dresses up as Tina to sneak backstage and attempts to eat Pam's hair. In the episode, Uncle Teddy, Tina is walking home from school when she spots Jonas, Reggie's Deli's new delivery boy. She starts to fantasize riding away on the back of his moped. Teddy, Bob's handyman and most loyal customer, is babysitting the kids while Bob and Linda are away at a burger convention. While Teddy, Louise, and Jean are distracted by Teddy unclogging the sink, Tina sneaks back to Reggie's deli to pick up sandwiches and hopes to see Jonas again. When Jonas comes back to the deli to pick up Tina's delivery, she tries to make small talk by telling him that her brother also has a keyboard. But Jonas gets irritated and corrects her by saying that it's a melodica, not a keyboard. Well, get a hello to you. Tina tells Jonas that she'll meet him at her house, but Jonas just offers to take her there since they're going to the same place. Her fantasy is then fulfilled when she hops on the back of his moped. Jonas notices that Tina likes him and uses it to his advantage. When he delivers the sandwiches, Tina lets it slip that her parents are out of town, and Jonas suggests that they have a gathering in the restaurant. Catch this. Got it. No, wait, I think I dropped it. When Jonas's friends arrive, Tina lies and says she's going downstairs to do homework in the restaurant, and Teddy doesn't suspect a thing. Jonas is just using Tina to look cool in front of his friends to make up for a leaky gazebo situation. But they think the restaurant is lame anyway, just like the leaky gazebo. They end up staying though, because Jonas offers them free burgers on Tina's behalf. Teddy hears a ruckus downstairs. <laughs> That's a funny word. Ruckus. Turns out, the ruckus is Jonas playing his melodica. The party is over and Tina is caught. Teddy kicks out all the kids who then decide to go to the cove by the lighthouse. Jonas invited Tina, but only so that she can bring burgers. Tina sneaks out and meets Jonas and his friends at the cove. Jonas is continuously trying to impress his friends, so he suggests that they sneak into the lighthouse and Tina agrees to do so too. They end up getting caught at the lighthouse by a ranger and they all leave Tina by herself. After Teddy discovers Tina is missing from her bed, he goes out to find her. He finds her detained in the back of a ranger's car and everyone is disappointed in her. After Teddy frees her, Jonas comes back and Tina thinks he came back for her. But Teddy points out that he just came back for his moped. And in a fit of rage, Teddy destroys his moped. In the episode Adventures in Chinchilla Sitting, Louise's class pet Chinchilla runs away and Jonas scoops him up from the sidewalk and drives away on his moped. We find out from Tammy that Jonas has a crush on Vanessa and Vanessa is going to Carla's high school party. So they crash Carla's party to get that Chinchilla from Jonas, but he doesn't have it because he gave it to Vanessa. When they confront Jonas at the party, he doesn't remember Tina at all. Hi Jonas. Hey, you? Girl? Whew, I was afraid you wouldn't remember me. Lesson of the day? Never trust a boy whose name starts with J. Ah, ow! My money maker! Here, let me see that for a second. <clears throat> ow! Let's finally talk about Ghost Boy. And now... Back to the episode The Land Ship. Tammy calls Tina an unsalted pretzel at the school assembly for the history of the land ship, since Tina is the only one excited for it. Tina can't stop thinking about it because she wants people to think she's spicy, fun, and dangerous. Tina discovers that Jordan Kagan is Ghost Boy, a mystery person who's been tagging ghosts all over the school. 
She catches him in the act, but decides not to turn him in to prove that she isn't an unsalted pretzel. She joins Jordan in his tagging escapades, and Jordan starts to fall for Tina the more time they spend together. He goes in for a kiss that is really sloppy, and I have war flashbacks. Jordan has the ultimate idea for his latest ghost boy. He wants to paint a giant ghost boy on the land ship sail for everyone to see during the parade. After they successfully paint the sail, Tina feels guilty and decides to paint over his work in the middle of the night. Jordan Jordan is really upset at Tina for doing this. And Tina's my girlfriend, or I thought she was. She was his first kiss and his last. Thank God. You painted over my heart, Tina. Then a random girl comes up and asks Jordan to hang out, and he agrees to. So, yeah. He moved on pretty fast. Also, he's only on the bat list because he was a bad kisser. Fuck the tagging. That's the true crime. Remember that episode I mentioned earlier, Ain't Miss Debatin'? Tina, of course, is dating Henry Haber in this episode. During their prep for the big debate on King's Head Island, her team is shown a video of the opposing team to get an idea of who they're up against. Tina is immediately attracted to one of those members whose name is Duncan. Wow. Uh, can, can we uh, roll back to Duncan? Bottle Robbies. And roll back again? I don't get it. Bottle Robbies. And again? Uh, why are Bottle we doing Robbies. this? Uh, and one more time? Last time. Bottle and Robbies. again? What? Bottle Robbies. Can you zoom? I can't zoom. Zoom and enhance? Enhance doesn't exist. She falls for him when she hears his New Zealand accent and admits that she has a thing for long neck boys with thick accents and or speech impediments. Same girl. I too like boys with good neck. Since Tina is attracted to Duncan, she takes her mom's advice to avoid him at all costs, no mixing. But then there's a debate team mixer. The only good debater on the other team, Sasha, notices Tina's high interest in Duncan and uses it to his advantage to throw Tina off her game. When Tina bumps into Duncan on the beach, she gets stuck outside with him in a view of the sunset. This dreamy scenario makes Tina kiss Duncan twice then run away. Duncan brags about the kiss during the debate while Tina and Henry are dealing with the aftermath of her actions. In the episode What About Blob, the kids go to Duncan and Sasha for help when a yacht club is trying to bleach some plankton that Jean has grown attached to. Tina gets distracted by Duncan's ankles because he's not wearing socks with his boaties. Ankles away. Come again? Hanky doodle damn, D. Sorry? A little something for the ink bank. I'm not following. In the episode Boy Watch, the kids are watching as the beaches are packed with people. When Tina spots a group of junior lifeguards rolling around in the sand after freshly getting out of the water, her interest is piqued. So she goes down for a closer look. The coach tells her that they're doing what they call sugar cookies. Tina is fascinated by all the physical contact that they make with each other. Junior lifeguard Kelly offers to put sunscreen on Michael's back and Michael offers to put sunscreen on her back after. Tina inquires about being a junior lifeguard. However, Kelly tells Tina that signups were last week and the coach tells her they're also at capacity when Kelly falls into a hole and sprains her ankle. This opens up a spot for Tina to join the junior lifeguards. The coach asks Tina why she wants to be a junior lifeguard, to which Tina immediately fantasizes about rolling around making sugar cookies with the other lifeguards. Contrary to her fantasy, she says that she always wanted to be a lifeguard because she's disciplined and a strong swimmer, which is not true. Yes, I'm taking your place, but I'm not the new Kelly. Michael, Whatever you had with Kelly doesn't just mean you have that with me. No, yeah, I, I know that. Unless it does. While doing toe touches, Tina decides to step back so she can get a good look at all their butts. But it's too much for her, so she gets back in position. Her constant yapping, however, gets everyone else in trouble. After her first day of practice, Linda asks if she learned anything, and Tina says that she learned that Kelly and Michael are still texting each other, and she believes that she's in a love triangle with them. Jeez, Dad, give the girl a break. She's probably exhausted from staring at all those lifeguard butts. Oh. Oh my God. Tina is in denial that the junior lifeguards don't like her because she's constantly getting them in trouble for her incompetence. When the coach threatens that they won't graduate, the whole team turns on her. In her delusion, she asks to put sunscreen on Michael's back and he rejects her outwardly. Then he and the others suggest that she should quit. Devastated in the office, about to quit, Tina sees the junior lifeguard wall. The neighborhood old guy, Gus, tells her that she's probably excited to be up on that wall. Tina admits that she only signed up to watch shirtless teen boys, to which Gus tells her outright that she's not JGM. What's JGM? Ugh, junior guard material. After an inspiring speech from Gus, Tina applies herself and improves at being a lifeguard, but one of the junior guards is still not convinced that she's JGM. Tina objects and promises that she's been keeping the chest glances to a minimum. She hasn't even been thinking about the love triangle between her, Michael, and Kelly. We're not in a love triangle. Yes, we are. We're handling it. Tina attempts to redeem herself after she gets everyone kicked off the team for doing a dangerous lifeguard drill with stolen equipment. 
When Tina spots a 3k fun run happening at the same time as a sandcastle competition, she gathers all the former junior guards to save the runners' ankles from Kelly's fate. And because Tina saved all their ankles and got the coach out of trouble for scheduling a fun run in a sandcastle contest on the same day, he agreed to let them graduate. But in order to graduate, they have to jump off the pier. Tina was afraid to do it until the coach agreed to let them do sugar cookies if she jumped off the pier. You mean... Sugar cookies? That's what I'm talking about. Sugar ah! cookies! And in the end, Michael still denies being in a love triangle with Tina. There's no love triangle. Okay, fine. Love square. Looking at you, Jason. What? You can support the channel by subscribing to my Patreon. Link in my description box down below. Okay, bye. Just like the rest of us, Tina finds love in some strange places. And who can blame her? Growing up watching cartoons, you find attraction in some of the least conventional ways. Chad the zombie shows up in the episode Bad Tina. He resides inside Tina's erotic friend fiction. In her friend fiction, she's in class doing a science experiment with her lab partner, Jimmy Jr. Her teacher warns that the mixture on their desk is the most powerful love potion known to man and advises them not to drink it. Jimmy Jr. doesn't listen and drinks the potion, making him want to touch butts. She fantasizes that she, Chad the zombie, and Jimmy Jr. have a three-way butt-squeezing love circle. We're introduced to the boy band Boys For Now in the season three episode, Boys For Now. Tina's Aunt Gail got her and Louise tickets to a Boys For Now concert. This is Tina's first concert, so she's super excited to go, but Louise is not a fan. When Aunt Gail calls to tell Tina that she had an emergency with her cats, Tina's upset because she's not going to be able to make it to the concert. Oh, my heart just pooped its pants. Louise feels bad and promises that she'll get Tina to that concert by any means. When they attempt to go to the concert on their bikes, they're stopped by the freeway. They see Zeke and his cousin at the gas station and get a ride from them the rest of the way. In the car, Tina is getting Louise caught up on the members of the boys for now. There's Griffin, Alan, Matt. He's moody and a little older. I think like 17. Maybe his mustache is 17, but he's 90. And Boo Boo. Tina claims she used to be a real Boo Boo booster, but now she's into Griffin. My childhood group was mindless behavior and my favorite member was Princeton. So I understood Tina's freak out when she wasn't able to go at first. Y'all remember the Fresh Beat Band? My mom told me and my sisters that she got us tickets to a Fresh Beat Band concert and we literally thought she was joking. I have twin brothers who are 10 years younger than me. So she assumed that we liked the Fresh Beat Band because we would watch Nick Jr. But we watched Nick Jr. because my little brothers watched Nick Jr. So my mom said she was contemplating on getting us fresh beat band tickets or mindless behavior. I'm sure you can all guess where that conversation went. Unfortunately, when I went to the mindless behavior concert, my glasses were broken, so I wasn't really able to see what was actually going on, but the vibes were good. It was a good time. At the concert, Tina feels lightheaded from anticipation, so Louise goes inside with her to make sure that she's safe. During the show, Louise is converted to a boo-boo booster. She becomes so obsessed that she attempts to sneak them backstage multiple times. Unsuccessful at getting them back there, they sneak onto the Boys For Now tour bus and hide in their dirty laundry. They obviously end up getting caught and Tina leaves with some sweaty souvenirs. On the way home, Louise is concerned at how Tina survives the way she does, claiming that she has a crush on every boy she knows. I'm no hero. I put my bra on one boob at a time like everyone else. In the episode The Hauntening, they're watching a new Boys For Now music video where a girl won a contest to be in the video. Tina couldn't cut her essay down to less than 30,000 words, so she didn't qualify to enter. In the episode Bye Bye Boob, Boo, Tina wants to support Louise when Boo Boo leaves the group, but Louise denies that she's affected by this in any way. We find out that Tina is a part of a Boys For Now fan club. They have a meeting after school to discuss Boo Boo's departure, and Tina would really like support from Louise. She and the rest of the members are upset that Boo Boo broke up the band and motioned to boycott Boo Boo's solo career. Unfortunately, Louise signed her up for the Boo Crew, a promotional tactic for Boo Boo's solo career to win a roller coaster ride with him at the Wonder Wharf. In the episode, just one of the boys for now, for now, there's an announcement on the news that there's an open casting call for a new member to replace Boo Boo, but it's for boys only. Bob asks Tina to grab extra napkins out of the car. Tina runs into a boy named Damon while she's holding the napkins and they go flying everywhere. When they meet eyes, Tina fantasizes that they fall in love and get married. 
Something like this actually happened to me at Camp Flogna in 2017. Some security guy had dropped his pin and we picked it up at the same time, like slowly locking eyes as we stood up. But I didn't think that guy was cute and I was just being nice. But he told me that it was a magical moment and it would be fate if we saw each other again. But I was avoiding him for the rest of that day. And I was like 17, which of course he didn't know that, but I was like, mm -mm. We find out that Damon is on his way to audition for the boys for now and runs off so he's not late. When Tina tells her family about her new potential boot thing, Louise claims that Tina falls in love at first sight all the time. Whoa. Whoa. Mm, excuse me. Whoa. Louise insinuates that Tina is boy crazy, but Tina denies that claim, correcting her saying that she's boy focused. When she declares that Damon is the one, Linda utters quietly that he's one of the ones. They wouldn't get it. Tina hatches a plan to dress up as a boy named Dino to sneak into the audition and prove to them that when she finds Damon, he will be the one. This is kind of like a rapid fire section because as soon as Tina makes it into the arena, she starts falling in love with every boy in her sights, getting distracted by all the butts aged 12 to 17. When she gets in line, a boy asks for a piece of gum and Tina immediately falls for him and goes into fantasy land. After feeling guilty for losing focus on Damon, Tina hides in the bathroom because she's getting overwhelmed by the amount of boys at this audition. She meets Chad in the bathroom, who's also hiding, and says it feels good to have someone to talk to who's a boy. All my best friends are girls. Tina begins to have a musical friends to lover fantasy about Chad that's very similar to Sixteen Candles and other generic 80s movies. Freaked out after getting off track again, she spots Damon across the room. She has to get to him fast, so she starts making up stories to skip ahead in line. Everyone allowed her to skip ahead, except for one boy, Jesse. He doesn't show any romantic interest in Tina, but that doesn't stop her from fantasizing an enemies to lovers scenario where they're work rivals who fall in love on a business trip. When Tina finally catches up to Damon after chasing him down, he introduces her to his best friend Hayden, and you'll never guess what happens next. Tina imagines a close proximity love triangle with Hayden and Damon set in space. Apparently there's no pants in space. And in the end, Tina admits that she's boy crazy and nuts for butts because she fantasized about 3.5 boys on the way to find Damon. In the episode, The Handyman Can, the Belchers are trying to get Teddy to gain his confidence back after an electrical mishap he caused by telling him stories where he's a handy hero. Tina tells Teddy a story involving the boys for now. They need help on top of Mount Everest. And in her own story, they don't even know her name. That checks out. And in the episode What About Job, Louise is bummed because she can't think of a dream career for her school project. And like the last episode I talked about, they're trying to make Louise feel better by telling her stories of cool jobs she can have. Louise is inquiring to Rudy about an unreleased Boys For Now single. Although it may not be canon because it's a made up story, Tina is the curator for the Boys For Now Museum and their manager and personal masseuse. In the episode, Tina and the Real Ghost, an exterminator claims that the Belcher basement is haunted. Linda and the kids bust out the Ouija board to summon the ghost, and they find out it's a 13-year-old boy named Jeff. To get rid of the ghost, they have to trap it in a box and throw it away, but Tina refuses to let them do it. She brings Jeff to school and starts to gain some popularity. Of course, she lets her imagination run wild and begins to fall in love with him. She takes Jeff to a butterfly sanctuary as a date and believes that the butterfly that lands on her mouth is Jeff giving her a kiss. Is it you, Jeff? Is this a sign? Mm. Mm. Oh boy, you really are real. What are you doing? <gasps> Tina announces to her family that she and Jeff are officially dating. Since her and Jeff are now official, this causes Tammy to be jealous and steal him from Tina. Tina and I are taking a break. Tammy, you are hot. Be my GF. Spirit <laughs> appears to be a bit of a player. Tammy was obviously the person who wrote the message on the mirror, but Tina believes it was really Jeff. Louise, of course, is not convinced. But when she notices Tina is really hurt by that betrayal, she admits that she was playing a prank on her family the whole time, and she was the one moving moving the Ouija board. Tina overhears this and does a uno reverse on Louise and everyone else. She pulls a revenge prank on Louise and Tammy by locking them in a mausoleum and writing a spooky message on the walls in ketchup. Checks out. But after finding out that Jeff isn't real, Tina admits that what she wanted out of Jeff was real. 
In the episode, Large Brother, Where Fart Thou, Tina's at her locker when she makes eye contact with Joe Harrison for a split second. The mystery of this interaction intrigues her, so she follows him down the hall while trying to manifest more eye contact. When Mr. Franz scolds Joe to get to detention, Tina gets herself in detention too, so that she can be in there with Joe Harrison. In detention, Tina is trying to force more eye contact with Joe, but a kid sits right in the middle of her eye view. Tina then asks Mr. Franz to go to the bathroom so that she can do the perfect head tilt and lock eyes with Joe. The plan is a success and she immediately imagines fireworks. What? What are you doing? You're just standing there. Are you gonna go to the bathroom or not? Just one second. Okay, now I'm going. While Tina is sharpening her pencil in front of class, she catches another glimpse of Joe, but she feels like the spark is gone. And since she lost the spark, she decides to give him her breakup eyes to let him down easy. She claims that he's hurting, but doesn't want to let it show. I mentioned Bruce in the Jimmy Jr. segment, so as promised, let's get into it. In the episode Every Which Way But Goose, Tina is excited that her theme, Night of the Living Dance, was chosen for the 8th grade dance. She's been anticipating Jimmy Jr.'s promposal-ish, but when Jimmy Jr. tells her that he's not going to the dance for reasons that we've already covered, and I guess I pulled a butt muscle. Ah! Tina is livid. She storms off and bumps into a goose in the park and starts to vent to it about Jimmy Jr. She claims that this is the best conversation that she's had in a while. If this is the best conversation you've had, then honk on the count of three. One, two, three, four, five, six. <coughs> I knew it. The town old man, Gus, tells Tina that Bruce the Goose must really like her because he sat and listened to all her stories. He claims that birds can grow strong attachments to people and that he himself may not have a strong attachment to Bruce the Goose because he's not that desperate. Tina avoids her dance committee duties to hang with Bruce the Goose in the park. This leaves Louise and Jean to pick up her slack in the restaurant, but they're under the impression that she's planning the dance after school. Linda thinks that Bruce the Goose is a kid named Bruce, but is concerned when she finds out that he's a goose named Bruce. Tina begins to completely ignore Jimmy Jr. because her conscience is consumed by Bruce the Goose. Like a tribe called Quest, you say the whole thing. They become closer by going on boat rides, getting matching bracelets, and taking long walks in the park. Tina even begins to write erotic friend fiction about Bruce the Goose in her diary, which her family ends up reading. No one's concerned about your future hybrid human goose babies and no one read your journal either, so just chill out! Louise and Jean decide to kidnap Bruce the Goose in hopes that she'll refocus on Jimmy Jr. Instead, Tina becomes concerned about Bruce the Goose. He breaks free from their trap and follows Tina to school. At the dance, Tina is moping and doesn't even care about Jimmy Jr. confessing why he couldn't go to the dance. I was too embarrassed to tell you. I pulled my butt muscle doing a very difficult move from Save the Last Dance. But her tone completely changes when Bruce the Goose crashes the dance. His bracelet gets stuck on the bleachers and he starts to freak out. Jimmy Jr. decides to be brave and save Bruce the Goose from being stuck. In the end, Tina says goodbye to Bruce the Goose while her family waits on her. She confesses that they shared a kiss and should probably never speak about that. Then she lets Bruce the Goose go free to find a new goose, but becomes slightly jealous when they get along really well and swim away. In the episode Crow's Encounters of the Bird Kind, Tina is trying to get her Thunder Girl badge for bird watching. We don't see it, but she claims that they saw Bruce the Goose and a bunch of other crows. In the episode Legends of the Mall, the Belcher family takes on the Mall 16 style. If you guys are so into death, how come you're all still alive? <gasps> As they go their separate ways, Tina says she's gonna scope out the mall dolls. Mall dolls? Boys at the mall, Galleria guys, Fashion Center fish, food court, Casanovas. I get it. Tina sees Tammy and Jocelyn, and they claim that Tina is not gonna be able to steal their mall dolls because she has zero mall game. But Tina makes a bet with them to prove them wrong. However, Tina is failing miserably, confirming that she in fact has zero mall game. Hi. What? Hang on, I'll catch up. <laughs> ah, two ways. Hi. Sorry. Hey. Hi. Oh, oh, tag. <coughs> Tina spots mall doll Brian, who's stretching because he's tired from soccer, which of course she finds attractive. She says that where there's soccer, there's shorts. And when he says that he's allergic to animals, she claims that he's also sensitive. Mm, 
sensitive like a baby's butt being susceptible to diaper rash, Brian decides to kick back and take an antihistamine while his friends go to the pet store. Tina approaches Brian casually to her standards, but when she goes to speak to him, he's asleep. Brian falls over onto her shoulder, which makes it seem like they're cuddling. A mall cop comes over to tell them that her boyfriend can't sleep there. Surprisingly, Tina does the right thing and says that he's not her boyfriend. Even his friends come over and think that Tina is his girlfriend. Wait. You're Brian's girlfriend? Tina is still denying these accusations. That is until Tammy comes and sees that Tina has a boyfriend and immediately grows envious. So Tina just can't resist this in your face moment. I mean, what does it freaking look like, Tammy? Tina's keeping up the charade that they're a couple until Brian's phone goes off and his real girlfriend, Amanda, texts him saying that she can't wait to kiss him again and she even writes his name on her binder. This leads his friends to believe that he's cheating on Tina. His friends tell her that she needs to wake him up and confront him about this. This. this is going a little too far even for Tina, so she tries to slip away and tells them to forget about her because the other girl sounds better. Brian wakes up confused as his friends are yelling at him about Tina, who he obviously doesn't know. How do you think I feel? I almost kissed Noah. Not really. Debatable. But his friends just think that he's pretending he doesn't know her. Tina starts going along with it and his friends end up turning on him. Brian's friends start to think that he's scummy and threaten not to be friends with him anymore. Tina can't take it and finally confesses that she doesn't know Brian and that everything happened so fast. So she let them think that they were together and that Brian didn't do anything wrong, but it doesn't work. Oh my God, Tina. You're protecting him. Obviously. We're supposed to believe that you're a crazy stranger who just plopped down on a bench next to a boy? That's what happened. Nice try. Even Brian begins to believe that Tina is just protecting him because nothing else makes sense, apparently. Tina is trying everything to get them to believe that she just made this up. And when Tammy comes to give her her props, she sees this as the perfect opportunity. Telling Tammy the truth unravels the whole facade because Tammy immediately believes her. Cause how could she get a boyfriend? She has no mall riz. Boo! Boo! This makes Brian and his friends finally believe Tina since Tammy knows her personally. Brian and his friends are just creeped out in the end and go their separate ways. And Brian goes back to his real girlfriend, Amanda. In the episode, Y tu Tina Tambien, Tina is suffering from a case of moody teen-itis. I mean, it's spring. It's supposed to be a time of change, adventure, hot spring flings where you roll around in blooming flowers, getting grass stains everywhere. Mm. Louise and Jean are trying to make her feel better by encouraging her to help them dunk their counselor, Mr. Frond, into the dunk tank at the fair. Louise invites her to practice with them at lunch so they can successfully do this. And Tina says that this is actually making her feel a little better until she steps into a puddle of water. In Spanish class, Tina is inattentive and doesn't know the Spanish translations her teacher is asking her to answer. Tina's last Spanish quizzes have been caca, per her teacher. So he signed her up for the Spanish language lab in the library, which is just a set of cassette tapes that someone donated in the corner of the library. Tina can't participate in dunk practice now because she has to go to the language lab at lunch. As Tina is listening to the tapes, she sees Louise outside of the window practicing at the dunk tank. Her pretend host family introduces themselves and she quickly becomes distracted when she hears the young boy's voice, who goes by Rodrigo. Quantos años tienes? How old are you? I'm diez, once, doce, trece. I'm trece años. Tina, who's not very good at Spanish, assumes that Rodrigo is asking if she's single, but he's really saying that they should go to the plaza and he'll buy her a popsicle. Of course, Tina starts to fantasize that this is a date between her and Rodrigo, using the dialogue from the tapes as conversation. Rodrigo, you just turned my blahs into ooh la la's. That's French. At home, Tina is in La La Land, fantasizing about her newfound love interest, and her family is starting to take notice that she snapped out of her funk. You're having a spring fling. Tina denies that she's having a spring fling, probably because he's not real and he lives in a cassette player. Louise and Jean become concerned when Tina is avoiding dunk practice to go to the library. Tina skips through the language tapes to get straight to the Rodrigo parts. This time, Rodrigo is teaching Tina Spanish in the scenario of frisbee practice. Tina gets frustrated when he's not responding back in a manner that she liked when Tina tells him that she likes him. She tells Rodrigo that although she's only been in language lab for a week, she feels they really connected somehow. 
Louise, being a very smart kid, pieces together that Tina is avoiding them because of a new boy. And this new boy must be in the library and that's why she's avoiding them at lunch. Louise and Jean decide to take a look for themselves and find Tina mid-air kiss with Rodrigo. I can't believe you're in love with the boy in your Spanish tape. I can. Louise has an intervention in Tina's room to knock some sense into her that this fantasy is going to lead nowhere. She's happy that it got her out of her funk, but she believes it's not gonna end well. And I can't believe the youngest sibling is the voice of reason in a situation like this. I guess you can't judge a book, right? The language tapes have really helped Tina with her Spanish, and she's doing pretty well in her test, until she sees the word park, which makes her reminisce about Rodrigo and their date in the park with the frisbee. But of course, in true Tina fashion, she decides to fail her quiz on purpose so that she can continue to listen to the language tapes. Louise and Jean are excited to have Tina back so they can finally practice dunking, but Tina reveals that she has to continue the language lab because she flunked her Spanish quiz. Louise calls out that she has been getting better at her Spanish, and as she's getting a closer look at Tina's test, she notices that every question is wrong. There's even marks where she erased her original answer and wrote something else. They realize that she purposely failed her quiz so that she could continue the language lab with Rodrigo. This hurts Louise because she feels like Tina is flaking on the three Dunketeers. Rodrigo is not real! What are you gonna do? Marry him and have his not real babies? After Tina and Louise's heated argument, she comes up with a plan to get Tina to come to the fair. Back at the language lab, Rodrigo and Tina are now at the beach. And and he's teaching her these new cool beachy Spanish words like oil and glasses. Mid-lesson, she's interrupted by Louise's voice, guilt tripping Tina to feel bad about leaving them hanging. Tina decides to fast forward the tape to get back to Rodrigo, who's now showing her different fruit in the market, when she's interrupted by Jean this time, who says that he's gonna hang out with them all day. In English, we call this a cock block. Tina attempts to keep fast forwarding, but is constantly met with Louise and Jean. And in an unfortunate fate, they kill Rodrigo off by having him get eaten by an alligator. The guilt tripping works on Tina, so she comes down to be with her siblings at the fair, instead of being in the playa with a super hot, totally not real, but also sensitive, Spanish teenage boy. You sure you'd rather be here? I'm 90% sure. It's Tina's turn to try and dunk Mr. Fran one last time. Tina imagines Rodrigo's lesson in frisbee throwing, remembering that you have to throw straight. She successfully dunks Mr. Fran, who was overly confident and brought his phone and new laptop into the tank. And the three dunketeers are finally back together. I hate to see you vamos, but I'd love to watch you vamos. I bet you thought we were done. Oh no, there's more. But I'll consider these to be Tina's honorable mentions. There was the Lobster Fest mascot, Roberto, Tina's paper mache love interest, mentioned it to for Tina. And one of them's not even paper mache like Roberto was? What happened to Roberto? Did you try to shower with him? Yeah. Joey and Owen O'Donnell from Family Fracas. Also in the episode The Fraud Files, Tina saves the day by seducing some zombies that were trying to eat them. Then she starts dating all 15 zombies at once. This is my top! Also, in the episode Torpedo, when she was in love with all 25 guys on the baseball team. In the episode Sexy Dance Fighting, it's kind of a two-in-one. She's sad about Jordan Sturman, who moved away, but then falls in love with the sexy dance fighting instructor, Gyro. And in the episode Dr. Yap, Tina has a crush on their family dentist, Dr. Yap, and spends the episode trying to get his attention. I think we should just be friends, with dental benefits. Okay. There were also moments in the episode Stand By Jean, where Tina gets a fortune, saying that she will find her true love at the end of her journey. She contemplates if Rudy is her true love because he has a sensitive side, until he says that she looks like his mom when she's tired. Then she contemplates if Zeke is her destiny, but realizes he's not that bright. Then entertains the idea of Daryl being her destiny, but then sees that he can't even open a gate. Um, let's keep looking. There's also a new kid named Will, who's new at Wagstaff in the season 14 episode, Bully Eve, it or not. But I'm not gonna consider him to be a love interest, contrary to the wiki, because Tina says he has a don't mess with me vibe that has a lot of the girls going. You do kind of have this whole don't mess with me vibe that has a lot of the girls around here going crazy. Other girls, not me, but I get it. And outside of that comment, she doesn't really shoot her shot at him and keeps it strictly hall monitor business. That's cold. I really hope I covered all of Tina's love interests in this video so far. It made me realize that while being a real lover girl may look strange to some, you gotta do what makes you happy in the end. One person breaks your heart, two people will take their place. And I guess I just haven't found the one yet. Well, there was that one time, but he ended up telling me he was in the process of being in an arranged marriage, so. 
Sometimes I feel like my life is like a Disney movie. Not the animated ones though, like a decom. And also I just want to give myself a pat on the back because I'm really proud of all the effort I put in to make a long form video like this. Somebody play Superpower by Beyonce. Not me because copyright, but somebody. Anyway, who are some of your least favorite Tina Belcher love interests? And who do you think actually deserves her? Let me know in the comments down below. And also if you'd like to see more Bob's Burgers content from me. I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you would like to keep up with me outside of YouTube, you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram. All that information along with any music that I use in my videos is always in the description box down below. If you made it to the end of this video, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to my channel and make sure you hit that notification bell to stay up to date with posts and uploads from me. But for now, I hope you guys have a great rest of your week and I hope to see you guys in my next video. Peace.